to the organizers for organizing this fantastic workshop. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, ways to get statistical privacy in witness indistinguishable argument systems. Um, this is based on two joint works. Uh, the first is with Yael Kalai and Amit Sahai, who are both here, uh, or Yael was here at least. Uh, and the next is, uh, uh, and this one gets uh, statistically witness indistinguishable arguments in the privately verifiable setting. Uh, the, the next one is, uh, improves upon this result in some ways uh, to get uh, WI arguments in the publicly verifiable setting. Uh, and this is joint work with Sai Krishna Badrinarayanan, uh, Rex Fernando, and Ayush Jain, who are all students at UCLA, and Amit Sahai, who's also at UCLA and who's here. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm going to focus on interactive proofs for NP languages in this talk, uh, where the prover has input an instance and a witness, and the verifier has input an instance, and the prover wants to convince the verifier that this instance is in the language. So we all know what these are because the entire workshop has been about these. Uh, but uh, but what, what I want to um, focus on is the two method setting. Um, and the standard properties that we want from such a proof system are completeness, which means that if X is in the language and the prover behaves honestly, the verifier should accept. And soundness, which says that if X is not in the language, then, the prover, uh, then, the, then no matter what the prover does, the verifier should reject the proof uh, with overwhelming probability. Uh, no. I will clarify that, though, in a minute. Um, and uh, another property that we typically want out of proof systems uh, is some sort of privacy. Uh, zero knowledge, unfortunately, is impossible in this two-method setting unless we rely on a trusted setup, which we don't want to do. Uh, what is known to be possible is a weaker uh, yet simple property called witness indistinguishability. Uh, this, uh, this guarantees that the view of a malicious verifier that interacts with, an, with a prover uh, does not reveal to the verifier the witness that the prover is using. Um, this makes sense for languages, uh, for instances that have more than one witness. And the guarantee is that the view of the verifier participating in game one, where the prover uses witness W1, should be indistinguishable from its view in game two, uh, when the prover is using witness W2. And so far, uh, existing proof systems have been secure against uh, only bounded or probabilistic polynomial time verifiers. And most have been secure against unbounded provers, uh, which means they satisfy statistical soundness, but they are not statistically witness indistinguishable. Um, and so known constructions are based on trapdoor permutations, bilinear maps, uh, and more recently on IO and one-way functions in this setting with an unbounded prover and a bounded verifier. And these are extensively used in various primitives and protocols. However, they all suffer from one strong limitation um, or one important limitation, which is that privacy is not everlasting. So none of these existing constructions uh, are secure if the verifier, after completing the proof, uh, runs his computer for 10 years and tries to uh, break the WI property. And also existing constructions are not uh, post-quantum secure, so if a quantum computer gets built in the meanwhile, uh, they become insecure too. You mean that they're, they're secure with respect to particular constant in the exponent, like n to the c, but not n to c plus one? Or oh, no, they're, they're not, no, they are secure with respect to all uh, c's. Oh, I mean uh, exponential runtime. It's just not everlasting. So if someone ran their machine for long enough and did, let's say, a, a yes, it's only computational privacy. If, if the assumption gets broken after the protocol finishes running, then you're in trouble. Yes. You want the assumption to, you want the assumption, only assume the assumption. Yes. So you want witness indistinguishability to be independent of the assumption that you're using. And maybe use the assumption only to guarantee soundness in a case where uh, the prover is bounded. Uh, and the verifier can run in unbounded time and maybe try to break the assumption. And the reason that this could be more desirable sometimes is that um, uh, soundness is typically required to be an online property. So if the prover, yes? Old school. I mean, are you saying more than computational versus information theoretic? No, I'm just saying that. Yes. <laughs> just explain why she prefers the zero knowledge to oh. be information theoretic and the soundness to be computational as opposed yes. to the other way around. Yes. So 
if at the time of running the proof your assumption is secure, then having a prover be bounded makes more sense than having the verifier, requiring the verifier, a malicious verifier to be bounded. Um, and so known constructions in this setting, uh, basically before the works that I'm going to talk about, uh, were, did not exist. So uh, what I will talk about are two results that get statistical witness indistinguishability. Uh, one is in a joint work with Yael Kalai and Amit Sahai, um, and gives two message WI in the privately verifiable setting. And using some tools from this work, together with some tools from recent work on instantiating Fiat Shamir, uh, we get, uh, uh, in, a, in a joint work with Badrin Narayanan, Fernando, Jen, um, and Amit Sahai, we get um, pub publicly verifiable two message statistically witness indistinguishable arguments. And uh, this same result was achieved in a concurrent work by Abhishek Jain and Zewen Jin. And, um, and so these are more, a little more in detail. The two results that I'll tell you about are that one, in the privately verifiable setting, uh, statistical WI arguments exist, assuming quasi-polynomial hardness of two message OT, which can in turn be instantiated from DDH, quadratic residuosity, nth residuosity, LWE, et cetera. And then the other theorem that I will talk about is that two message publicly verifiable statistical WI arguments exist, assuming the quasi-polynomial hardness of the learning with errors assumption. Uh, this is also the first construction of ZAPs, or publicly verifiable two message WI, from lattice-based assumptions. Um, and there, there is another concurrent work of Lombardi, Vekuntanathan, and Wicks, who obtain computational WI arguments from lattice-based assumptions. Uh, so their result is not statistically WI, but it is also uh, the first post-quantum zap. Yes? Just to clarify to myself, so if you're considering honest verifier, then any old like, statistical miss would do. Yes. So, yes, this is malicious verifier. Isn't the QAP-based snark when you allow the verifier to send this here as a statistically uh, zero knowledge? Uh, I think honest verifier. Honest verifier, yeah. Honest verifier, what if the verifier sends something malicious rather than something? So we care about a malicious verifier. Okay, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. So the starting point for both of these constructions is a natural sigma protocol, uh, which, uh, and we start with a variant of the three round WI proof for graph Hamiltonicity due to Blum, where the prover has a graph G and wants to prove to the verifier that this graph has a Hamiltonian cycle. Um, the prover simply commits to a permutation on this graph um, and the permutation. And on input a challenge, either decommits to the entire permuted graph uh, and reveals the permutation, proving that he co computed this permutation correctly, or decommits to the edges of the permutation of the Hamiltonian cycle in this permuted graph. Um, and I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this, uh, but the reason that I'm using this specific example here is uh, because it satisfies a certain property. Um, this property, is that for every message sent by a, a potentially malicious prover, there exists a single challenge on which the prover can convince the verifier to accept the proof if X is not in the language. And moreover, this single challenge is an efficiently computable function of the value that lies inside the commitments generated by the prover in the first round. So for instance, a prover that commits to uh, for instance, uh, for a graph that does not have a Hamiltonian cycle, a prover can either convincingly commit to a permutation on this graph or commit to a random graph that has a Hamiltonian in it. But once he is committed, there is exactly one bad challenge on which the prover can decommit and force a verifier to accept when X is not in the language. Um, this is a variant of the property that is also used in other uh, recent Fiat Shamir type compilers. Um, and Based on this, uh, okay. So based on this property, we ideally want to. Sorry. Um, it's just stated a little differently in those compilers. Um, yeah. So you need that this challenge is unique. Yes, there is a unique challenge that is efficiently computable if one gives you the values that were inside the commitment. 
And so, so this is clearly just computationally witness indistinguishable and does not uh, satisfy any guarantees against an unbounded verifier. So the first thing that we will do is modify it into a statistically witness indistinguishable argument by replacing the commitment used by the prover with a statistically hiding commitment. Um, so this will just be a two-method statistically hiding commitment. And the rest of the protocol remains the same. But now this modified protocol does not satisfy that property that I just talked about. Because uh, if, the commit if a commitment is statistically hiding, uh, an unbounded prover can open it many different ways. And there is no single challenge then that would uh, allow a cheating prover to uh, cause the verifier to accept the proof. And instead, all challenges, or most challenges, would have uh, responses that an unbounded prover could compute, uh, forcing a verifier to accept such a proof. So, um, but this is still the broad template that we will use. And we will show how to instantiate this uh, template with a special type of statistically hiding commitment. Um, in order to allow for the Fiat Shamir type compiler um, to work. So using this template, uh, we, we obtain both two message privately verifiable statistical WI and publicly verifiable statistical WI. Uh, the privately verifiable result relies on compressing this four message modified Blum argument using the uh, BMW heuristic uh, and oblivious transfer uh, to get a two message argument. And I'm not going to go into too many details of that here. Um, I'll focus on the other one. Uh, I just want to say a few things about this uh, compression. So this is known to work for proof systems. Um, and we make it work for certain types of arguments, like the modified Blum argument that I just uh, described. And this heuristic necessarily only gives private verifiability. So to get publicly verifiable statistical WI, the heuristic that we use uh, and instantiate is the fiat shamir heuristic. Uh, where we take, again, the modified Blum protocol, and I've decluttered notation here uh, to remove uh, the permutation and graph representation, et cetera. But we should just remember that this is actually the Blum, Blum protocol. And then the Fiat Shamir heuristic says that this can be compressed by using a hash function, so that the prover, in addition to providing the first message of the statistically hiding commitment, also provides a hash key. And then the, uh, sorry, sorry, the verifier, in addition to providing the first message of the statistically hiding commitment, also provides a hash key. And then the prover responds to this commitment, committing to his values, computes a challenge by applying the hash on the commitment uh, transcript so far. And then based on this challenge, decommits to certain parts of uh, the committed value. So think of this as a parallel repetition of many modified Blum protocols that's just been compressed using the Fiat Shamir heuristic. And you don't need any property, any randomizable property, right? This hash yeah, so we're going to show how to instantiate it with a real world hash, exactly. Uh, so two tools will help us prove soundness of this compressed construction. Uh, the first is a special type of a statistically hiding commitment scheme. Um, and the second is a correlation intractable hash function. Uh, the correlation intractable hash that we use specifically is the one, is a quasi polynomially secure variant of the one constructed based on LWE, very recently by Pykert and Shehan. Um, so, what is a correlation intractable hash? Uh, these were first introduced by Canetti, Goldreich, and Halevi. And these are defined with respect to a function family. Uh, and can also be generalized to relations, but we only care about them with respect to functions uh, in this work. Um, and uh, they consist of two algorithms. There's a setup algorithm that on input, a function from this family generates a hash key, and an evaluation algorithm that on input, a hash key and value x outputs some value y. Uh, the properties that these algorithms satisfy are correlation intractability, which requires that for every function in the family, the probability that an adversary given a hash key that was generated by running the setup algorithm on this function. Uh, so the probability that an adversary given this hash key outputs an x such that hash of x equals f of x is negligible. What this means is that it should be difficult to find an x such that hash of x equals f of x for h generated by running the setup on function f. And the second property is indistinguishability of hash keys, which basically just requires that the hash key hide the function f that was used to generate it. Um, 
why is this useful? Uh, so there are, uh, so b before talking about why this is useful, I, uh, let me just point out a bunch of recent constructions uh, that have uh, obtained correlation interactable hash functions for various families of functions uh, based on different assumptions. So there was the work of Canetti, Chen, Raisin, and Rothblum, uh, and then the work of Holmgren and Lombardi that obtained these uh, hash functions based on various uh, less standard assumptions. And then more recently, there is uh, the, the work of Canetti, Chen, Holmgren, Lombardi, Rothblum, Rothblum, and Wicks, um, as well as the works of Pycarta and Shehan, uh, got uh, constructions of correlation intractable hash functions uh, based on circular secure FHE and then plain LWE, respectively. And uh, borrowing, I, and, and they used these to get uh, the first constructions of non interactive zero knowledge from plain LWE. Uh, so borrowing from their ideas, let's see what happens when we try to instantiate the hash function uh, in, our in, in our fiat Shamir compression with a correlation intractable hash function. Um, suppose this correlation intractable hash had the property that for every commitment string, there is at most, so sorry, suppose, the, suppose our scheme had the property that for every commitment scheme, there is at most one bad challenge uh, such that the prover can even compute a, uh, uh, an accepting answer on this challenge. What we would then do is we would set our function f for the correlation intractable hash family to be that bad challenge. And by the property of the correlation intractable hash, we would have the guarantee that uh, h of x is not equal to f of x, and therefore the prover wouldn't be able to cheat. Um, Unfortunately, a statistically hiding commitment, like I said, does not give us this property for free. Um, and there's an even bigger problem, which is that the function f that we want to set to be, to, to be the one that computes our bad challenge is not an efficiently computable function of the value that's being committed. Uh, sorry, yeah, of the value that's being committed. Um, actually, that doesn't even make sense here necessarily because this is a statistically hiding commitment that just loses the value that's being com committed information theoretically. So, uh, so our learning from this is that we need to design a special type of statistically hiding commitment scheme that makes the function f efficiently computable some of the time and gives us the required property that we want, uh, which is that the function f uh, which, which is this property that for every A and B, there is at most one bad challenge. Uh, and we'll design a commitment that also gives us this property some of the time. So what do I mean by giving us this property some of the time? Uh, well, the, uh, the concrete object that we will use is a two-message statistically hiding extractable commitment scheme. So this was uh, introduced and first constructed uh, in this first paper on privately verifiable WI, and then we modified it for use in the publicly verifiable setting. Uh, so a, two a statistically hiding extractable commitment is a two-message commitment scheme that is in the plain model uh, that satisfies statistical hiding and computational binding. And moreover, it is extractable. Now, again, extractability sounds like a contradiction to the statistical hiding property of a two-message scheme. But the reason that this is not a contradiction is that we design a commitment that operates in two modes. One is an extractable mode, uh, where the hiding guarantee does not hold. And one is the regular hiding mode, uh, where w which is statistically hiding. Um, and the, the commitment operates in extractable mode with only a very small probability. So even when it is in extractable mode, the statistical hiding property still holds because it is in non-extractable statistically hiding mode most of the time with probability 1 minus epsilon. Uh, yes? Again, a question. Yes. If you use the commitment scheme that's computationally distinguishable from one that's statistically binding, would that not uh, work? If you use the commitment scheme that's computationally indistinguishable. It's actually statistically hiding, but it happens to be computationally distinguishable from one that's statistically binding. Um, uh, yes, so you would want something that from the point of view of the prover is indistinguishable from one that's computationally, that's statistically binding. And that is kind of the property that we, we design. So, yeah. There's another problem 
No, you also need to make sure that the receiver can't force the can't maliciously choose like the yeah. first message making this the scheme binding. Okay. Which is yes, which is exactly the, the next thing I was going to say, which is that the committer should not be able to tell what mode the scheme is in, so that he cannot break soundness in one mode and not break soundness in the other. And moreover, the receiver should not be able to set the scheme to be extractable all the time, because then that would violate statistical hiding. We have in the world. Sorry? We have CRSs in the world. Yes. yes. <laughs> but we want to do this without a CRS. And so what we will do is have both of them decide what mode the commitment operates in. So how do we get both of them to decide this? Well, we get them to implement an erasure channel. So what does this erasure channel do? It takes the committer's input and transmits it to the receiver with only a small probability, epsilon. And with the remaining 1 minus epsilon probability, this channel just information theoretically erases the message. In. And it's crucial for our proofs to work that the committer doesn't know whether or not the message M got transmitted. Uh, that's, what, that's the kind of uh, erasure channel that we will try to implement. Uh, unfortunately, these don't exist in the plane model. So what we'll do is uh, we will rely on um, statistically sender private oblivious transfer in order to implement this. A statistically sender private oblivious transfer scheme uh, ha uh, is one where a sender has two messages, M0 and M1, and an unbounded receiver has input a choice bit. And they run a two message oblivious transfer protocol, at the end of which the receiver gets the CF message of the sender. Uh, the security properties that we want out of these are that the sender should not know what the choice bit of the receiver is, and an unbounded receiver should not learn the other message, should not learn any information about the other message of the sender, which is the one that he chose not to receive. Um, that's written out more formally here. Um, and there are known constructions of such statistically sender private oblivious transfer based on the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption, the quadratic residuosity, and the nth residuosity assumption, as well as the learning with errors assumption. The first is due to Naur and Pincus. The second is due to uh, Halevi and Kalai. And very recently, uh, Rekursky and Dotling constructed this based on the LWE assumption. So using this oblivious transfer, we're going to implement an erasure channel between the committer and the receiver in a way that forces the committer to transmit his message with probability at least epsilon and forces the receiver to not receive this message with probability any more than epsilon. And the way we will do this is that the receiver will choose a random challenge, which is going to be n bits long. This n is going to allow us to control the probability that the with which the receiver gets uh, the message. The receiver will then construct an OT message using this challenge. Uh, that, uh, so for every i, uh, the receiver will send an OT message where his choice bit is going to correspond to the ith bit of this challenge. The committer is going on input message m, samples a random string that is n bits long, and encodes his message in, in the following way. So he creates a matrix where all entries in this matrix are random. Except for uh, except that the entries uh, at sorry except that the entries in this matrix that are indexed by the bits of R XOR to the actual message. So if the random string is zero one zero da da da, the, then the first then in this uh, two dimensional array um, M one zero XOR with M two one and so forth is going to be the actual message. What this guarantees is that the message M is secret shared between N parts, and the probability that the receiver gets the message M actually corresponds to the probability that he guessed all these N parts correctly. So let me just complete the scheme first. The committer sends in the clear this value R, as well as oblivious transfers uh, that transmit the messages, both messages, at every index R. <coughs> At the end of this, the receiver just gets the messages corresponding to his challenge string, which means that he gets the right message. Uh, so the receiver gets the right message if and only if the receiver's challenge string happens to be equal to the random uh, value chosen by the sender. The probability that this happens uh, is 
we, we can prove that the probability that this happens is close to what you would expect, which is roughly 1 by 2 to the n, um, because the oblivious transfer message hides the receiver's challenge. And the committer, uh, even if he chooses R maliciously, cannot um, bias R to be equal or not equal to the challenge with probability better than what you would expect. So the scheme is also statistically hiding whenever the challenge is not equal to R. And this follows by the statistical uh, sender privacy property of the OT, because the OT just loses all the messages where the, uh, where the ith bit of the challenge was not equal to the ith bit of R that was chosen by the committer. And most importantly, the committer here cannot tell whether or not his challenge equals the randomness R that was sampled by the receiver. And this is because the challenge of the receiver is uh, hidden uh, computationally by the oblivious transfer which is why the soundness guarantee is only, is only going to be computational looking ahead. Okay. So that completes our construction of statistically hiding extractable commitments. In order to get epsilon to something like 1 by k to the log k, we are going to just set uh, our, the, the length of these challenge and random strings to be something like log square k, k being the security parameter. And this is going to guarantee that the two, that CH and R are roughly going to be equal with probability 1 by k to the log k, which corresponds to extractable mode for the commitment. And uh, the remaining probability uh, will contribute to the hiding property of the commitment. OK. So now next let's, sorry, yes. OK. So next let's use this to try to instantiate Fiat Shamir. Uh, now even, so, so the first thing that we do is make our statistically hiding commitment a statistically hiding extractable commitment. And we make our hash a correlation intractable hash. And then we use the statistically hiding extractable property to argue that if a prover breaks soundness with probability 1 over poly when the commitment is in normal mode, then the prover must also continue to break soundness with probability 1 by poly when conditioned on being in extraction mode. And the reason this is true is because the commitment has this guarantee that the committer doesn't know what mode he is operating in. So if soundness holds in one mode, it must also hold in the other. And next, we will use the fact that soundness holds in extractable mode in order to, ar uh, to, in order to uh, argue that uh, the correlation, in, in order to argue that the prover breaks correlation intractability of the hash function. Uh, with this epsilon over poly probability uh, and get a contradiction to the correlation intractability of the hash. So this is just as you would expect. Um, and it turns out that even though this is a really low probability event, uh, it still suffices to get a contradiction if we set our parameters for the correlation intractable hash carefully enough. Um, there are many subtleties that uh, happen when instantiate, when, when arguing uh, the formal proof according to this template. And the, f uh, the first thing that we need to do is to carefully set the function f that allows us to compute this bad challenge in order to contradict correlation intractability. We also need to set other parameters carefully enough to ensure that statistical hiding and um, soundness work, to work well together. One other subtlety that arises is that our proof requires us to get uh, some n number, of poly, uh, n number of commitments, where n is a polynomial in the security parameter, that are all jointly extractable with probability that does not grow, uh, that, that is independent of n, so that does not grow exponentially small as n grows large. And the reason that we need that is uh, because we need, um, it, it turns out that when we set various parameters carefully, we need a certain number of parallel repetitions to guarantee a certain level of soundness. That dictates the number, the, the number of commitments n that we need. Um, and to ensure that that fits in properly with the correlation intractability of the hash function family, uh, we need them to be jointly extractable with this probability. Uh, notice that the construction that I just described does not 
uh, does not easily directly extend to satisfy this property because we just constructed one commitment that was extractable with probability 1 by k to the log k. And if you blindly extend it to create n commitments, then the probability that you extract from all n of those is going to grow exponentially small in n. So this needs to be done in a somewhat careful way. And then um, let me just conclude with some open problems. The first is, can we obtain two message statistical witness indistinguishable protocols based on polynomial assumptions? Uh, so note that both approaches that I uh, referred to today make crucial use of statistically hiding extractable commitments, which inherently require super polynomial time assumptions. So can we do without those assumptions? And another question is, can we get new compilers for other types of sigma protocols that do not follow this specific template where there exists this one bad challenge that allows you to get a contradiction? Um, and can we make those work also in the statistical setting? Um, that concludes my talk. Thank you. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't thought about that. You probably could. Could you reuse the first message? Can you reuse? Yes. Can you reuse the first? message? Yes. I think in the publicly verifiable setting you, you can. So, but so if you do the reset, then then also, like if I can learn the answer, that the verified accepted the verified. Yeah, it's it's verifiable. publicly verifiable. So, so. It also adaptive so sound. Um, so that's a good, it's, it's not as it is. It's only adaptively sound if you leverage parameters su sufficiently so that the hardness of your language is less than the hardness of the OT that you use to get the receiver message. Also, sound limitations for usability. Yes. Um, so, so yes. about, about the uh, second, I think, open question about the one, uh, one bad challenge? Yes. From what I recall, uh, the future mirror, to get the NIST, the future mirror stuff also works if as long as the number of bad is not too large. So the same, like, in particular, the three coloring thing would be, it should be fine as well. Um, yeah, I think you need polynomially many bad challenges. Um, polynomial would work, yeah. right? Any polynomial. That would also, ex yeah, that would, that would work even for us. But in the private in the privately verifiable setting, also we rely on this one bad challenge oh, wow. property, actually, for soundness. Yeah. It's possible that that can be extended in some other non-trivial ways, but... Any more questions?